Please join in the call to worship. We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another. Come, let us worship together. She loves uh, applause, uh, so why don't you give her some applause? <laughs> now that's enough for one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good you know, that's not bad, but it's not good. Uh, I think I said Birmingham Unitarian Church. You see, that's you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Ed. <laughs> Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good morning, Ed. I love it. <laughs> My God, you're good. <laughs> well, it's certainly good to be together, together again after two years of Zooming and after one year coming back and being here today. It's good to see you. It's good to have you here. It really is good to have you here. So we're now we're going to do the welcoming to our neighbors who are with us on Zoom. We bring up the slide and there they are. They're waving to us, or at least they usually do. I'm looking at you, I don't know. <laughs> They're waving at us. Now we're going to turn to the camera in the back and wave to them. Good morning, good morning, y'all. <laughs> well, as a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection opportunity, greeting our virtual neighbors and first we have now seen them, of course. We've heard them. Well, we haven't heard them, but they're hearing us. So here we are, gathered in person, seeing each other, shaking hands, hugging each other, looking at each other in the eyes, and saying, oh my gosh, it is so good to see you. We now light a candle as the symbol of Unitarian Universalism around the country. We light this candle in recognition of new formations of worshipers coming together in a living room. 
We honor those who have outgrown the living rooms and gone to rental spaces in the neighborhood. And we recognize those churches, those meetings around the world where individuals gather together in sanctuaries. May all of this be in our hearts and our minds as we light the chalice this morning. Please rise in body and or spirit and join in singing, How Could Anyone, number 1053. <clears throat> Today's theme is who we want to be. Humans have long struggled with the question of what keeps us from being what we want to be. That's a long way of saying sin. Today's topic is sin. We're part of a religious tradition that affirms us for who we are. This is in contrast to a belief that we're born with something wrong with us. At the same time, we all know that we fail and fall short of our aspirations. It can be a little bit of a puzzle that I look forward to reading and sharing with you and opening this up today. Our Time for All Ages today, a story for it, comes from this collection of stories called A Lamp in Every Corner. This is a very special book because it's a collection of Unitarian Universalist stories. And this is put together by Janine K. Grossmeyer. And this story is called Muddy Children, and it's about Hosea Ballou. Over 200 years ago, in a small house, in a small town, on the edge of a forest of very big trees in the state of New Hampshire, there lived a small boy. His name was Hosea Ballou. Hosea, just like other children, liked to learn and knew, do new things. He was always asking questions about what and why and how, and just like other children, Hosea liked to play. He liked to play hide and seek with his nine older brothers and sisters. He liked to play word games inside when it was rainy, and he liked to play tag outside when it was sunny. In the winter, he liked to jump into snowdrifts. In the summer, he liked to jump into the creek. In the fall, he liked to jump into leaf piles. And in the spring, 
Why, in the spring, that was his favorite season of all, because in the spring, it would rain and rain and rain, and then Hosea could jump into mud. Hosea, just like other children, loved mud. He liked it when it was soft and squishy. He liked it when it was thick and sticky. If it didn't rain quite enough, well, that wasn't a problem. Hosea would carry the water to the dirt and create glorious mud puddles all of his own. He liked to poke sticks into puddles and see how deep the mud was. He liked to make mud pies and build mud dams. He liked to jump in puddles hard with both feet and make the muddy water splash really high so that the mud splattered all over his brothers and sisters' clothes. And he loved to step in puddles very slowly so that the mud oozed up a little between his toes. Yes, Hosea loved mud. Now, you can imagine that not everybody in the family liked mud quite as much as Hosea did. His mother had died when he was not quite two, so his older sisters took care of him. His sister who did laundry and scrubbed the family's dirty clothes in big wash tubs didn't like having to scrub all that mud off of Hosea's clothes or off of everybody else's clothes either after Hosea had stomped in the mud extra hard. His other older sister who kept the children clean didn't like having to scrub all that mud off of Hosea. And Hosea, just like other children, didn't like having baths, especially when that meant he had to stand in a wash tub in front of the fire and have water dumped all over his head. But his sisters loved him, and so they took him home and washed him and dried him and made him clean. Then Hosea's sisters went to their father and said, Father, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. Hosea, said his father very sternly, you should not play in the mud. Why? asked Hosea, because, just like other children, asking questions was another thing he loved to do. Because, said his father, who was one of the preachers in the Baptist church the family went to, just as we try to leave a good life, to be kind to other people, and to follow God's plan, we try to stay clean. Yes, father, Hosea said, and after that day, he did indeed try to stay clean. But it wasn't easy. He stopped stomping in mud puddles on purpose and splashing muddy water everywhere, and he stopped making enormous mud pies. But sometimes the mud was just there. Then he had to walk through the mud to get across the yard to gather the eggs from the chickens. He had to walk in the mud to feed the pigs. And sometimes, when he was already muddy from doing his chores, he played in the mud just a little bit and got even muddier. <laughs> his sisters, who loved him, took him home and washed him and dried him and made him clean. But Hosea's sisters went to their father again and said, Father, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. Hosea, his father said even more sternly, you must not play in the mud. Yes, father, Hosea said, he was sad because he had truly not tried to get muddy, most of the time anyway. Are you very angry with me, Father? I am disappointed in you, Hosea, and I'm a little angry with you. Hosea hung his head and kicked the dirt with his toes. Then he dared to look up just a little to ask, do you still love me? Hosea, his father said, uh, not not too stern anymore, he said, I will always love you, Hosea, no matter what you do. Even if I get muddy again? Yes. Even if I get really, really muddy? <laughs> yes. Even if I get mud all the way up to my eyebrows and between my fingers and toes and my hair? Even then, his father said with a smile. And then he added, very stern again, but remember, Hosea, you must try to stay clean. I'll remember, and I'll try. Hosea promised, and he did. 
He stayed clean, most of the time anyway. As he grew up, he stopped liking mud quite so much, but he still liked to ask questions about how and what and why. Father, Hosea asked when he was a teenager, how can it be that our church believes that God will only let one in a thousand people into heaven, even if many of those, good, those thousand people lead good lives? His father didn't have an answer for that question. Father, Hosea asked, if I had the power to create a living creature, if I knew that the creature would have a miserable life, would suffer and die and then go to hell and be miserable forever, and I went ahead and created it anyway, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? And would I be good or bad? His father didn't have an answer for that question either. Hosea had to find his own answers. So he read the Bible, a book with many stories about religious people and about God. He went to some universalist churches and asked more questions there. At the age of 19, Hosea decided that he believed in universal salvation, which is the idea that everyone, everywhere, Everyone in the universe will be given salvation. Eventually, everyone will be saved from hell. And not only did Hosea believe that God would let more than one in a thousand people into heaven, Hosea Ballou believed God would eventually let everyone into heaven, good and bad. How can you believe that? asked his father. How can you believe that God would let bad people into heaven? Because, Father, I remember what you told me when I was small. I believe that even if God is disappointed in his children or a little angry with them, he will always love them and want them to be happy, no matter what they do and no matter how muddy they are. At this time, we're gonna have our children and youth head on over to our Green Door classroom where we're going to begin our covenanting process for the year. For you shall go out in joy, for you shall go out in joy, The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way that we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in the areas of environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our recipient this month is one of our cherished longtime projects. This year is the 25 year anniversary of the initiation of our partnerships with Pontiac Elementary Schools. At Walt Whitman Elementary School, we foster learning for K through five students by stocking and operating a mobile library in the school. And by the way, we have English and Spanish books now added to our collection to support the school. We also, offering tutor, we also offer tutoring and other programs that help students learn and feel supported by the community. Your offering will be used <clears throat> to buy books for the library and supplies for our programs. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and ourselves to its service. We'll try that one again. We move into a time of spiritual practice. Last week we were introduced to what is being called embodied practice as a start of this time in the worship service. Now it's a very simple thing. The concept is that we come here for an hour on Sunday morning and we sit unless we're singing a hymn, and we're not uh, engaging our body other than that. So the premise is we would like to do something that doesn't break our traditions too much, but do something that engages mind and body. So today we're going to do the same one that we did last week. We begin by holding up our hands, the one hand, and then with the other, we start here with the little finger, and in your thoughts, I want you to think about something that is of importance to you. For example, uh, it could be uh, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe in love. That's 
an option, but you might do something entirely different. It's up to you to think about something as we go through this little exercise, and we're going to do it for all five fingers. So I'll start with you. You can either say something or you can be quiet, it's up to you. All right, let's start. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. Ring finger. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. Thank you. This is also the time when we bring to consciousness the joys and sorrows in the congregation. I have only one sorrow today, or one can say it's a mix between a sorrow and a joy because the person being discussed is no longer in Beaumont Hospital. I did visit him last Sunday in my role as pastoral care associate. Marie Davids uh, uh, writes uh, this. Morris Leppard is now in Evergreen Rehabilitation Center. After a fall in which he crushed his L2 vertebra, he would happily reserve cards and visits. Morris Leppard. Now let's take a moment to think in silence of concerns that come to our minds in a time of strangeness in our lives, in our politics, sometimes strangeness in our families. We hear today are, of course, always concerned about ourselves, but we're also concerned about our loved ones. We're concerned about strange things happening in a divided country. We're concerned about intense floods across the world, which are causing the deaths of thousands of people. We are concerned about the war in Ukraine where citizens become fodder for cannons and one country has tried to take over another. There are so many issues before us, but we can also know, know that joy is possible Joy is there. It's there in human relationships. It's there in how we love and respect. 
people of goodwill. And with those who feel unloved and unrespected, perhaps we can be in some way models for them. Please now take a moment in silence, thinking upon things that are important to you. The first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 22. God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil. It was everywhere, morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation. Make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes and bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. This is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and saw how bad it was Everyone corrupt and corrupting. Life itself corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making a clean sweep. Build yourself a ship from teak wood. Make rooms in it coated with pitch inside and out. Make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 
and 45 feet high. Build a roof for it and put it put in a window 18 inches from the top. Put it in a door on the side of the ship and make three decks, lower, middle, and upper. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. Total destruction. But I'm going to make a covenant with you. You'll board the ship and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives will come on board with you. You are also to take two of every living creature, a male and a female, on board the ship to preserve their lives with you. Two of every species of bird, mammal, and reptile. Two of everything, so as to preserve their lives along with yours. Also, get all the food you'll need and store it up for you and them. Noah did everything God commanded him to do. Him for the Hurting by Amanda Gorman. Everything hurts. Our hearts shadowed and strange. Minds made muddled and mute. The carry tragedy, terrifying and true. And yet, None of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage. Even our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive and even harder stay that way. We're burdened to live out these days, but while at the same time blessed to outlive them, the alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. May we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we, may we choose our children over chaos. And may another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange but only when everything hurts may everything change.
am not Reverend Mandy. <laughs> she is unable to be with us, and um, I hope that you will keep her in your thoughts this week as she gets well and her family gets well. So I am sharing her sermon this morning. It is her creation. It is her writing. So if I look out at you and your eyes are closed, I'm going to know that you're not sleeping because you're not going to want to miss a word that she has written. And that you will be imagining her voice, her pragmatics, and her words. Today, I am her instrument. It is estimated that the version, the Genesis version that I just read, of the ancient flood story is about 2,500 years old. When we read a text as old as this, it tells us more about the authors than it does about the nature of the divine. The authors of this story, the ancient Hebrew poets, were convinced there was something innately wrong with humanity. And the name of that wrongness is violence. I think it is very telling that we've been coming up with stories about our own destruction since the beginning of our ability to tell stories. We still do this today. We come up with narratives about aliens destroying us because of our inability to collaborate or to work together in support of our planet or perhaps an environmental cataclysm. It's brought on by the mistreatment by us of our planet. Speaking of planets, We've even come up with stories where we've been replaced by apes following a nuclear war. Remember that film? We love stories about being punished to death for being inherently bad. I used a very folksy translation of the story today, but that is the word used in most English translations of the text. The Hebrew word is ruined. Humanity was ruined. And so God, according to the Hebrew poets, wanted to start over. I think it's very relatable to feel that the world is just so off track that we might like to hit the reset button. You know, just like an Etch-a-Sketch. Give it a good shake and it's all clean again. The troubles of our time are thick and numerous. The troubles of yesteryear were the same, and the troubles of tomorrow will be also. It can be overwhelming. Why can we not get out of our own way? People have been thinking about this for a long time, and there are many frameworks for thinking about this. Unitarian Universalism is progeny of two liberal Christian traditions, and today we are working with Hebrew scripture. So I'm going to focus mostly there. However, everyone throughout space and time has wondered, what keeps us from being who we are and who we aspire to be? Historic Christianity answered the question with a doctrine called original sin. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The doctrine of original sin is only an idea and not a particularly good idea. It's nothing that we're beholden to, but we're kind of stuck with it in some ways. The idea that humanity is inherently sinful and in need of redemption is baked into our society. And again, it is part of the roots of Unitarian Universalism. A very high level 
a very high level reminder of our roots could go like this. The Unitarians believe there was a pure divine spark in everyone that was corrupted through the influence of others. They essentially believed they could work out any character flaw through self-improvement. The Universalist believed that salvation had been achieved for everyone across all space and time throughout the death and resurrection of Jesus. They believed it was their responsibility to create heaven on earth through social improvement. Efforts like education, prison reform, sanitation, on and on. It is a gross oversimplification, but easy to remember. The Universalists believed that God was too good to damn them to hell, and the Unitarians believed they were too damn good. <laughs> it has to be said that American Unitarianism and Universalism developed as a counterpoint to the harsh Calvinist theory and theology of the time. Both the Unitarians and the Universalists were responding to a need in American theological discourse, the need to ease up a little. Because if the idea of just about everybody going to hell hadn't worked yet, what was the evidence to support that it ever would? That was a particularly universalist argument. The Unitarians found all the talk of hellfire a little <coughs> common, a little gauche, and more than just a little superstitious. So most of our progenitors moved away from talking about hell and sinfulness so much. They turned their attention instead to the earthly realm, to the good works that are still a hallmark of our living tradition today. Making heaven on earth through justice and equity. We still call this collective salvation or collective liberation. When the Unitarians and Universalists merged in 1961, one of the things they could agree on was the importance of the human condition. If humanity is suffering the whole world round, we know we still have work to do. Thus, the focus of Unitarian Universalism is this lifetime. It is on serving humanity, being the best we can be, but bringing everyone along with us as best as we can. That's how we got ourselves out of the hellfire and brimstone business. But here we are now 62 years later, and I think we have a different problem. I think there is still a persistent fear that there is something wrong with us. And it's not just vestigial guilt from previous religious traditions that some of us grew up in. I think we know that there is something about us that keeps us from being what we want to be. We have all of these lofty aspirations of how to be Unitarian Universalist in the world, in the church, in our homes, and we don't always live up to that. Famed mid-century theologian Reinhold Niebuhr Niebuhr, who was based in Detroit for a bit, by the way, said that sin is a historical fact. That's in his seminal work, The Nature and Destiny of Man, which I highly recommend if you're into reading really big books about theology. Sin is a historical fact. He was writing in the context of the Second World War looking back at how things had gotten to be the way they were and thinking about where they might be going. There is something in us that keeps us from being what 
we want to be, from doing what we want to do collectively, but also individually, because the collective is a collection of individuals. Our Unitarian and Universalist forebears tried to get away from the idea of sin as a means of punishment, shame, and behavioral control. And they were right for that. But I wonder, was there an overcorrection? By not talking about sin, we did not undo the mounting evidence that we consistently fall short of our aspirations. Not only do we keep falling short by erasing the language of sin from our liberal religion, we also lost the language of redemption. And yet, we live with the looming fear that there is something deeply wrong with us. Or to use the word from the story of Noah, corrupt. It's just now there's no clear path back. An unfortunate byproduct of cutting out most discussion of our sin in our liberal religious tradition has left us bereft of a language for dealing with our own shortcomings and the shortcomings of our society. This can make life in a UU congregation a little challenging sometimes. When we are left with the knowledge of our shortcomings and no way out of the woods, we are left with limited options. When confronted with the evidence of a shortcoming, one option is to double down, go for the self-righteous path. That's right, I did that and I'd do it again. This is a close relative of the I have the right to conscience argument that is sometimes used to explain bad behavior in UU congregations. It's the unfortunate offspring of our Unitarian forebears' interest in self-development and the sanctity of the individual. The other common method for dealing with evidence of a personal shortcoming is You'll recognize it. Denial. Sometimes this looks like a person refusing to even have a conversation about their behavior with the people who were impacted. Or people just leave a congregation rather than have a conversation or sit with the discomfort of a conflict. Neither of these responses puts us on the road back to repair, where there has been a rupture in a relationship. But I have a lot of empathy for these responses. Denial and self-righteousness both are rooted in shame. Not talking about sin didn't make it go away, didn't make it less real, or less of a historical fact. We need a new approach for dealing with shortcomings. And it has to be said that the word most commonly translated as sin means to miss the mark. Both the Greek and Hebrew words found in the original manuscripts translate more closely as to fall short or miss one's destination. The word sin was an archery term, meaning to miss the bullseye. Everyone misses the mark sometimes. It's a historical fact. So let's normalize that in liberal religious communities. We all mess up. When it doesn't feel safe to mess up, we lean hard into perfectionism, self-righteousness, and denial. None of those get us any closer to beloved community, that world we dream about, 
what our universalist forebears called heaven on earth. I don't imagine that reality to be much different from our current reality. The beloved community is not a fairy tale where we all get unicorns to ride and live happily ever after. But it's here and now, but different. The rules of reality are not different in the beloved community. The rules of engagement are. When the Hebrew poets wrote about their worries and sorrows over the human condition, they named violence as the reason God would want to start over. It is ever so. The violence we bring on ourselves and each other have not decreased or increased. It has changed. When we stopped talking about sin, we also stopped talking about forgiveness, reconciliation, redemption, and grace. And that is violence. It is internalized violence to beat ourselves up for missing the mark when it is part of our design to miss the mark. It is violence to refuse to make amends with one another because we are ashamed to admit that we missed the mark. It is violence to separate people who have missed the mark without offering a path back. Sin, missing the mark, is intrinsic to the human experience. Therefore, so should be grace. Grace for ourselves, grace for each other. It is okay to make mistakes and it is possible to make amends. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our final hymn for this morning, Amazing Grace. Oh, no. 
At the end of the hour, we leave a sanctuary and we go out into the world. The question is, what do we take from this hour that helps to make us and our lives and families better than they were when we walked in? The light of the chalice goes out, but let's remember that light can be a symbol of clear-headedness and reason. The warmth of the flame goes out, but let us never forget that warmth is a metaphor for love. May it be, and amen.